Alhamdulillah, just to begin, I want to say, just before I came up here, that um, there is a brother in the house tonight, or maybe more than one, maybe a brother and a sister, who is Muslim inside his soul, but he has not found the words to come out on his tongue yet. So he knows who he is. And when I saw him, he's from the same background as me. And when I saw him, I remembered myself 21 years ago. First time I came inside a masjid to find out more about Islam. I left saying, La ilaha illallah, alhamdulillah. The greatest night of my life. So everybody, I just want you all to make a dua for that brother, that Allah guides him to the best thing. Inshallah tonight, or very soon when Allah wills. I say Ameen. I mean, alhamdulillah. So alhamdulillah, tonight we're speaking about the Isra and the Miraj. And the Isra and the Miraj is a story we all know. But as Allah SWT says, وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Remind. Because rem remembrances benefit the believers. And in reality, as I've said before, that the Isra and the Miraj in reality is a love story. It's a love story that goes all in a circle. It's a love story of love for of Allah for His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's a love story of the Prophet Sallallahu love for his Ummah, for all of us. And this, that love that, that we find from Rasul Sallallahu is what makes us know who Allah is. It makes us love Allah more. And that love is actually coming from Allah. So it's just going all over the place, Alhamdulillah. And when you're talking about the Isra and the Miraj, we have to really open the story. How does it unfold? What's the background to it? The background is this scenario in which the Prophet ﷺ has just left Taif. And the Prophet ﷺ was stoned going into Taif to call the people to Islam in the Meccan period. They had been persecuted there for almost 12 years, 11 to 12 years. And the Prophet ﷺ, after he got his revelation and he was preaching to the people to become Muslim, a small group of his companions around him were Muslim. But the persecution got so much, they boycotted his entire tribe. And after this time, we know he faced the loss of his beloved uncle who was protecting him, Abu Talib, and his beloved wife, Khadija. Anha. So after these years of boycott in which he had almost they were starving. They would eat the leaves from the trees and it would give them blisters on their, on their lips. He said that there were times when I did not have enough to eat except for what Bilal who could hide underneath his armpit. We just had a great meal today. And our Prophet ﷺ, not one night, not two nights, he passed months and weeks, weeks and months with nothing to eat except what someone could hide and bring to him. Why? Because he had something that he wanted to take to the rest of the world. And he had something that was destined to reach the heart of all of us here tonight. And all of the Muslim Ummah. And that is La ilaha illallah. And so the Prophet ﷺ went through such immense suffering. And when he went, he tried to take that message to Ta'if. That let's see if someone outside of Mecca will help me with this message. And so the Prophet ﷺ went there and as we know, they rejected him and they stoned him until his shoes were filled with blood and blood was coming from his face. And they made two lines outside of the town and as he tried to walk, they would stone him on either side and he would fall down to his knees and they would pick him up from his, under his arms and push him further along. Finally, he reached outside of the town and collapsed inside a garden. And this is where he makes this historic dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is where we begin from. He raises his hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Allahumma ilayka ashku da'fa quwwati. He says, oh Allah, to you I complain of the weakness of my strength. And how little wahilata wa qillata hilati. And the fact that I have no other trick or device left. I have no other strategy left. And I complain to you of my being belittled in front of people, in front of those people of Ta'if. O oh, most merciful of those who show mercy. You are the Lord of those people who are weak. And you are my Lord. Who will you leave me towards? Who will you leave me towards? Towards someone 
who I don't know, who will basically mistreat me, or to an enemy who you have given power over me, as long as you're not angry with me, oh Allah, as long as you're not angry with me, then I don't care. Then I don't care. But your ease will be, will be, will be easier on me. Relief will be easier on me. And then he proceeded to say a dua. Bring the mic closer. And so he then proceeded to finish that dua in such a beautiful way. Now just imagine how the heavens must have rocked at hearing the best of creation complaining like this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've never seen a dua like this from the Prophet And we know that the, Allah even sent the angel of that mountain to offer, I'll destroy these people of Ta'if if you want. The Prophet said no. Because if they don't believe, maybe their next generation will believe. And subhanAllah, within that same generation, they all became believers. Allahu Akbar. And it was in this situation of such difficulty and distress that he came back and some time passed. And they say it was about some months, perhaps 11 to 16 months before the Hijrah, that the Prophet ﷺ had this experience. It was a full body experience in, in, in his waking state, in which he was sleeping. Some say he was sleeping, some reports say he was sleeping inside the Hijr of the Kaaba. Some say in his house, some say in the house of his cousin. And he was awoken. They say that the roof was taken off and Angel Jibreel came down not entering through the door. Literally, the roof came off and he came inside. Why? To show this is not some normal situation. This is not a normal type of, 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 of revelation that he's bringing down. And he came and he woke the Prophet ﷺ and asked him to rise. And then Jibreel salam, he ordered him to get up, according to some narrations, ordered him to make tawaf and make uh, some prayer. And Jibreel alayhi salam, there are different narrations about the details of the Isra and the Mi'raj. Why are there different narrations? Because back then it was very early in the Meccan period. There were not that many companions memorizing the Hadith. There wasn't that many people who were recording. They were very, very persecuted. They had no time to relax. And so different Sahaba heard different reports. And this is how it's come down to us today. And it is said that before, one of the narrations even mentions the splitting of his chest. That just like when he was a child and the angels came and opened his chest and extracted his heart and cleansed it with zamzam and ice and poured into it iman and hikmah, faith and wisdom. And they, it is said, the ulama say that happened when he was a child with Halima Saadiya in order for him to grow up as a righteous and, and a perfect youth. And it is said that now his heart was being prepared for what? For for to meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because not everybody, not every heart can handle that meeting these days something small surprises us and we say oh gosh now just imagine you're being called by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a meeting and then the Prophet sallallahu was told was, Burak was brought now Burak as we know how he's described that it is a, uh, he's a it is a steed Burak is a steed, meaning a heavenly mount that is bigger than a donkey and smaller than a mule. And this Burak is the same flying steed that was ridden on by the previous prophets. It is said that Ibrahim salam used to be given the Burak by Allah to come to see Hajra and Ismail in Mecca when he was in Palestine. So he would come back and forth in that way. And Burak was brought towards him in another narration. There are different narrations. In one narration, Burak, when the Prophet ﷺ tried to come on top of him, Burak was unfamiliar with who this was. And so Burak became a little skittish, as horses and, and riding mounts do. And Jibreel ﷺ had to tell him, have some shame. There has been no one of the servants of Allah who has ridden you that is more noble than him, than the, the Prophet ﷺ. And he became, when he realized it was Rasulullah ﷺ, it is said that Burak froze and began to sweat. And the Prophet ﷺ, he rode the Burak. And they, they, subhanAllah, one of the things about a leader, when you go to seek a leader, you have to, you know, take that journey. Musa ﷺ, when he was given the appointment to 
to come to the burning bush to receive the Torah. Musa salam, had to go through the jungle, he had to go through mountains, he had to go through all these things to finally reach that place on the mountaintop at a certain time, given like a deadline. The Prophet sallallahu so the, Musa was the one who was seeking and Allah was the one who was sought. Here, the Prophet sallallahu was in his house sleeping and rather Allah sent the conveyance right to his doorstep, I mean right through his roof, showing the, the station of our Prophet sallallahu and then when the when Burak took off, it is said that Jibreel salam, was flying with Burak. And we know that the Burak, it comes from the word Bark. Bark means lightning. He was traveling at the fastest speed. That even as far as the eye could see, he could make that in one single leap, meaning cover from here to the horizon, as far as the eye can see. And that too, when you're up. And so Burak would go at such a speed, and there's so many amazing things. Now this is just stop here for one second. This is the truth. This is the haqq. And subhanAllah, even from here, sometimes, Muslims when you hear, wait a second, just because some atheist scientist says, oh, the Muslims believe that Muhammad flew to heaven on a winged horse. It's because in their life, they've lost belief, and all they have are mythologies, and all they have are Harry Potter, and all they have is are these types of myths and stories and legends. But those things even come from the fact, the idea, where is it even inspired from? From the idea that there is a Lord who can do whatever He wills and create whatever He wills. And so for us Muslims, even this alone is an act of Iman to understand that the Burak, what it was, and that no one can explain who Burak, how, what exactly Burak is like, but we believe it with all of our hearts. And subhanAllah, Burak, as he took him through the sky, the night sky, just imagine uh, how tranquil and how peaceful and blessed that night must have been. And as he's going through, subhanAllah, this, which is showing that subhanAllah, every day should have a good car, <laughs> a good vehicle, because Allah sent the best of vehicles for the Prophet ﷺ. And as he's going through, it, there are reports that the Prophet ﷺ would stop on the way to Jerusalem every once in a while. At first, he stopped at one place. And uh, Jibreel said, I will tell him to alight, to come off and pray two rakahs. And so he would come off and he stopped at Midian. Midian is where Musa salam, and his tree was. And then it is said that they went to Tur Sinin. It is said that they went to Bethlehem, Bethlehem, right? Where Isa salam, was born, where Jesus was born. And it said then he also passed the road which Ibrahim and Ismail used to take to Mecca. And so what, what was the point of stopping on all these places to show that these are all of our sacred places too. The place where Musa salam, was, Nahnu ahakku bi Musa binkum. The Prophet salam, said to the people of the book, we are more deserving of Musa than you are. And he stopped at the place where Jesus was born. Why? To connect the dots. It was about saying and recognizing that all these places are not the, are not the holy places of some other religions. And Muslims have just what came at the end. All of those places are from Allah, all of those places are for Islam. And then the Prophet Sallallahu what did he do? He, as he went, they finally arrived by night at Masjid Al-Aqsa. Masjid Al-Aqsa being what? The furthest masjid. This is where Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, as we heard the ayah today, Subhana alladhi asra bi abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-harami ila al-masjid al-aqsa. Glory be to what the one who took his servant on a journey by night from the Masjid al-Haram in Mecca to the Masjid al-Aqsa, the furthest masjid, the furthest temple, which is the, the, the place of worship built by Sulaiman alayhi salam in one single night, right? الَّذِي بَارَكْنَا حَوْلَهُ لِنُرِيَهُ مِنْ آيَاتِنَا That Masjid Al-Aqsa, Allah says, that we blessed all around it. Not just the one building itself, that one masjid, that one area. No, Allah blessed all around that area. That's the Holy Land. In order to show Him our signs. And indeed, إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ Indeed, Allah is all-hearing and all-seeing. What is he all hearing and all seeing? In this case, the, the Mufassirin, they say Allah was hearing what? The dua of the Prophet when he was alone in the garden asking for help. 
And Allah is Basir. He's seeing everything. He's seeing what people are doing to his beloved Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But don't think that he abandoned our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. No. No. He sees everything that's happening. And this is why, subhanAllah, the, one of the ulama, uh, Allah Matibi, actually mentions that the Samir and the Basir actually also has a chance of referring to the Prophet Sallallahu because of the fact that the Prophet ﷺ would hear the speech of Allah and according to some narrations, see Allah on that day. And so the Prophet ﷺ, as he comes out, now just imagine, the way that we understand Masjid al-Aqsa today, it has the Dome of the Rock, don't picture that, because that wasn't there. <laughs> that was built after the Muslims came. And Masjid al the, the Masjid al-Qibli, what we call Masjid al-Aqsa, it's not a building. People get this wrong, you have these forwards going around. That this is the Masjid al-Aqsa. No, that's Masjid al-Aqsa. No. The entire platform, the entire raised platform, the Temple Mount, is what is Masjid al-Aqsa. It's a whole place is a Masjid. And so the Prophet ﷺ came there, and it had actually been abandoned and not used by the Romans for centuries by that point, as a disrespect to the previous Ahl Kitab. And the Prophet ﷺ came there, and he says, as I came in, in one narration, he says, I recognized some, there were people there. Some were in Rukua, some were in Qiyam, some were in Sujood. He said, I recognize them as the prophets. The Prophet ﷺ had not seen the prophets before, but something came in his heart that these are the prophets. Allah put that in his heart. And when, the, and when those people were done, when all the prophets were there, there were some of the prophets that he had heard about in the Quran and some that Allah did not mention before. All the prophets were gathered there. A number that we don't even know, only Allah knows. And as soon as they were finished, then subhanAllah, what happens? But a, a call for prayer is given. This is not the adhan, but a call to pray is, is given. And the Prophet ﷺ is naturally told to lead. And the Prophet ﷺ goes forward. And all of the Prophets come behind him to pray. Which shows what? The rank of our beloved Rasul ﷺ. You know, when you're among equals, and it's time to pray, what does everybody say? No, you lead. No, no, please, please, please. You do it. No, 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 not me. I mean, you lead. You lead. Because nobody wants to feel like they're better than anybody else. But all the prophets knew that this was the one to lead. Because this is the one, Rasulullah wasallam, that they had all been waiting for. This is the Rasul wasallam, that when they heard there was going to be this ummah, the best ummah to ever come to the face of this earth, they said, oh Allah, they all made dua. Let me be the prophet of that ummah. Allah didn't accept that dua. They said, okay, if I can't be the prophet of that ummah, let me be part of that ummah. And the only one that will get that is Isa salam, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And so now when they see this prophet, just imagine the delight that they have, that they have gone on from this world and yet Allah brings them back, brings their souls back in body and flesh to pray with the Prophet And when, subhanAllah, this is why, subhanAllah, you think, now the Rasul sallallahu he was treading on earth, but look how he was dealt with by the people on earth. Look how he was treated. But there was one place where he was appreciated. There was one place where people were longing to see him and they had never seen him yet, but they respected and loved him so much. And that was the people of the Samawat, the people of the heavens. And when he came, he led them in a prayer showing the unity of Islam and the fact that the Khilafah, the, the custodianship of the message of Allah was being passed from all of those previous prophets to our beloved Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then as he finished, Jibreel Alayhi Salam brought a tray with a two vessels, one vessel full of milk and one vessel full of wine. Now, this was a time when it was not haram to drink wine. So you could, it's halal. If I give you two halal options, you have options. And yet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he still chose the milk. Milk, what does it represent? Milk is unadulterated. unadulterated. It is pure. There's no interference in it. Wine has to, you know, be vinegar and then, you know, it basically has to go bad and then become wine. Showing that there's something pure about Islam. And when he took that milk, he just naturally avoided wine, even before it was haram. And Jibreel said, Asabt al fitra He says, you have chosen the natural way. And in one report, Jibreel alayhi salam, Gabriel says, had you chosen the wine, your ummah would have gone astray. Your ummah would have been led astray. One sip of the Prophet sallallahu determines what? The guidance of the ummah. 
Had the Prophet ﷺ drank wine on that day, maybe there would have been Muslims who came and said, look, our Prophet drank wine that time. I'm just doing that now. And subhanAllah, even the small actions of the Prophet ﷺ are connected to our guidance. One little thing the Prophet ﷺ does could determine the fate of the Ummah. And so we don't realize how intimately connected we are to Rasulullah ﷺ. How intimately connected. Just like as... as as you can say, as a child, an infant running around, and the mother is watching over the infant. That infant is completely oblivious, running around, maybe hurting itself, knocking into things, making noise, and yet not worried about feeding, not worried about getting changed. And yet there is a mother or a father over that child. The Prophet ﷺ had more love for us than that. Watching over us, making sure that every little action does not misguide his ummah in the future. And the Prophet ﷺ then, when he had chosen, this is when they made, what that was the Isra, the night journey. Then came time for the Mi'raj. That was the ascension. And what does that show us? That shows us that sometimes we have to do the horizontal journey in this world. We have to take the, the journey. When you do your part and you take that journey, Allah will take the vertical journey for you to go up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our hearts. And so the Prophet ﷺ was taken then with Angel Jibreel السلام, and he went through the skies. In some, in some narrations as well, it was a mi'raj. It was actually steps that were leading up. And so the Prophet ﷺ then went and we know the story about the different prophets he meets at the different levels. But let's talk a little bit about the things that he sees as he's flying through the heavens first. He sees many different things, many wondrous things. The Prophet ﷺ saw heaven and hell. He saw it making noise. And he saw even the angel that stands over hellfire, Malik, Khazan al-Nar. And that angel never smiled since it was created because of the job that it has. And he was told that if it would have smiled for anyone, it would have been for you, O Rasulullah, but it doesn't smile. And the Prophet ﷺ, he saw people being punished in various ways. He saw people being punished. Now imagine an ummah he loves and cries for all night. How, did he, how do you think it feels to see people from his ummah being punished? And so he saw people who had wondrous dishes of meat available to them. Maybe steaks, barbecue, what, we don't know what. Roast. And yet there was rotten, putrid meat. And they were going to eat that meat instead of the, the pure, wholesome fresh meat and it was told he said what's happening here and he was told that these are the people who leave their halal spouses in this world and go towards haram zina and the prophet ﷺ saw people subhanallah getting their heads smashed the prophet ﷺ saw women hanging from their chests those people who commit zina and then kill their children after the Prophet ﷺ saw people being fed fire, eating fire, just imagine, into their bellies. And he asked, what is this? And he said, these are the people who eat the wealth of orphans. Who eat the wealth of orphans. How many times in our cultures do we deprive our daughters of their inheritance? Our sisters of their inheritance? SubhanAllah. Don't think it's just the orphans and, oh, we don't do that. In our cultures, do our women get their inheritance? And the Prophet ﷺ saw people who were getting their tongue and lips cut off with scissors. And he said, these are the people, may Allah protect us, these are the people who preach to other people, but they don't follow what they preach. May Allah protect us. And he saw people scratching their faces, and these are the people who backbite other people. When you're with each other, and you say, oh, this person I, oh, this person is so dumb. This person, look how she looks. Look how they are. They're like this. They're like that. Scratching your face on the day of judgment. Do you want to be doing that? And so subhanAllah, why did the Prophet ﷺ, it filled him with concern. So when he came back, he told us about these sins. And so he wasn't shown these things as a type of a mor morbid entertainment. No, he was shown so that he could get concern and bring this to us so we could be safe on the Day of Judgment, that we don't end up in that situation. And the Prophet ﷺ, we know he was shown the Dajjal as well. The Prophet ﷺ, in some reports, the Prophet ﷺ was also shown as he flew over the grave of Musa salam on a red hill, which we don't know exactly where that is today. It's not marked. 
uh, he saw Musa Hassan praying inside his grave. How does that mean? You're up in the sky, you're looking through a grave, and you're seeing a prophet praying inside his grave. Allahu Akbar. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he was flying through the skies, a beautiful, a, a fragrant smell filled his nostrils. And he said, what is that beautiful fragrance? That fragrance is paradise. And Jibreel salam said, that is Mashita ibn Tufir, ibn Tufir'aum. That is the lady who used to comb the hair of the daughter of Pharaoh. So he said, what's the, what do you mean? That's the smell of the lady? What does that mean? And Jibreel told him this story and said, Fir'aun was the greatest tyrant, we know that. He was a great oppressor. There's, there's never been a greater tyrant than Fir'aun, who even declared himself God and oppressed the Bani Israel. And he used to forbid anyone from worshipping anyone other than him. However, his daughter, Fir'aun's daughter, who was like a princess, she had a servant. That servant used to comb the hair of that princess, of the daughter of Fir'aun, comb, combing the hair at night perhaps. And one day she dropped the comb on the ground and she bent down to pick it up and said, Bismillah, and picked it up. Just like when you might just say, Bismillah. And the daughter of Fir'aun turned and said, what did you just say? In the name of Allah? Do you, take a, do you take a God besides my father? And what did that lady say? The, 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 the servant. She said, my Lord and your Lord is Allah. That's a time of great test. When you're asked, you're tested on your faith. And you say, my Lord and your Lord is Allah. Not just this is my belief. And you have your belief. I have my belief. My Lord and your Lord is Allah. She said, I'm going to tell my father. She told Fir'aun, in the house, in the palace of Fir'aun, there's a person who believes in Allah, subhanAllah. So that lady was bought. And Fir'aun brought not only her, but brought her husband and her children. And a cauldron was brought as well, like a type of a big, an iron pot. And there was a fire that was stoked underneath it, burning. And he asked this lady, do you take a Lord other than me? And she said, my Lord and your Lord is Allah in front of Firam. And he said, bring the husband. And the husband was taken and thrown alive inside that flame until he burned to death. And that lady did not recant her faith. Even hearing the cries and screams of her husband burning to death, she did not recant her faith. And then Fir'aun saw she's not giving up. He took the first child and he threw the, that child in the cauldron. And one by one, that lady lost all of her children. And then the, the, the lady, the last child that she had was a nursling, a newborn baby. And she said, Fir'aun, I have one request from you. I have a haq on you. Now, kings are arrogant. So when they hear someone saying, oh, you have a request from me before I kill you, what is it? And she said, when I die, I want you to take my ashes and bones and my husband's and my children and wrap us up in one cloth and bury us together. He said, this is a haq you have on me. I'll do this for you. And as he began to take away, the guards came to take away the baby. Emotion now finally got to the mother. And she started to get emotional and resist. And the Prophet tells us that the baby itself spoke. Oh, my mother, be patient for you are in the haq. And she, let her, she watched her child being thrown in. And then she herself did not recant and she was thrown in. Do you know there are Muslims today who go through these things? Do you know what our brothers and sisters in China are going through? Do you know what our brothers and sisters in some other places are going through just to say La ilaha illallah? This is a timeless story. It is a story of believers holding on to their faith at all costs. And then she gets into the cauldron and she burns as well. And of course they were wrapped up and buried. So now tell me, why is it? Perhaps, why can we speculate? Why does the Prophet smell a beautiful fragrance? Why is it a fragrance that she represents? Why? Why? Hmm? Yeah, the shuhada, they're martyrs, they're shuhada. But why a smell? What do you think about it? I thought about this, and Allah knows best. But anyone who has gone through any type of that disaster. They say that the, the smell 
of burning flesh of a human is the worst thing, the most nausea. And she had to, she had to see that of her own children. And yet Allah decided to perfume the whole heavens with her smell because of her iman. And that the Rasul had to stop and say, what is this? What is this woman's name? We don't know. This is a nameless woman, an unsung hero. That all we can do is say, Allahu Akbar. May Allah, may Allah grant her even higher and higher station when we hear these words. Just remember that the heroes, the people who stand up for Iman in the Ummah, in since the previous Ummah, they're not always the popular people. They're sometimes they're the people you would think, oh, lady who combs the hair. Don't look down on people. Every believer, la ilaha illallah is in their heart. And then the Prophet Sallallahu he then goes up to all the skies. And in the first sky, they come towards the gate and the gates of Jannah are closed. And Jibreel alayhi salam, he knocks on that gate and a voice comes and says, who is it? He says, Jibreel. He says, is there anyone with you? He says, Muhammad sallallahu And he said, have you been, has he been sent for? And Jibreel alayhi salam said, yes. And so the doors open, marhaban, welcome. Those doors are closed because it's showing the, 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 the status of the Prophet ﷺ, that there no one else is allowed in. The Prophet ﷺ, it opens as though they are expecting him. When you say that name, Muhammad ﷺ, doors of Jannah start to open. When we hear that name, what does it do for our hearts? Does it open our hearts? And the Prophet ﷺ goes inside and he sees Adam salam. Jibreel tells him, this is your father Adam. Say salams to him. The Prophet ﷺ said salams to him. And Adam salam said, welcome to a righteous son and a righteous prophet. And after some time, he goes to the second heaven, the second, uh, sorry, sky. And the same thing takes place. They knock, who is it? Jibreel. Has someone with you? Muhammad ﷺ. Is he sent for? Yes, he was sent for. Meaning it's time. It's time. And then the gates are opened. And he sees who? He sees Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, and Yahya, John the Baptist, as they call him today. Alayhim salam, two cousins. And the Prophet said they used to look alike. They were resembling each other as cousins, daughters of two, uh, sons of two sisters. And they say, Marhaban, welcome to a righteous brother and a righteous prophet. And they, they, they meet each other for some time. And then after the Prophet goes to the third heaven, where he sees they go to the same process, knocking, and then the gates are opened. And the gates are open, they say, and he sees Yusuf alayhi salam, Joseph. Yusuf alayhi salam, the Prophet salam, says, first thing he describes, he says he was given half of beauty. When you see, you know, when you see a really stunningly beautiful person, you can't help but notice that they're beautiful. He doesn't mention anything. He says, the Prophet salam said immediately that he was given half of beauty. But it is said the Prophet salam, was given all of beauty. But his beauty was so much that had we understood what his true beauty was, we wouldn't have been able to, subhanAllah, no one would have been able, have been able to handle it in this world. That's why they say that when the ladies saw Yusuf alayhi salam, they cut their hands out of wonder at how beautiful someone could be. And it is said that if the ladies had saw Muhammad, seen Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, that they would have cut their hearts. They would have cut their hearts. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, he was welcomed. Welcome to a righteous prophet, a righteous brother and a righteous prophet. And then he went to the fourth sky and the same interchange took place at the gates. And he saw Idris alayhi salam, who said, welcome to a righteous brother and a righteous prophet. And then he went to the fifth sky where he saw Harun alayhi salam, where he said, welcome to a righteous brother and a righteous prophet. And finally he came to the sixth heaven, to the sixth sky, we should call it Samar. And when he, that door opened, Lo and behold, he saw Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam welcomed him and said to him, welcome to a righteous brother and a righteous prophet. Now, the Prophet stayed with him some time. And it is said in some narrations that Musa alayhi salam advised that when you're going up for your discourse, go easy on the ummah. You know, it, ask for ease for your ummah. That Musa alayhi salam advised him. Now, as the Prophet salam was parting from Musa alayhi salam, he saw Musa alayhi salam crying. Now the question is this, there are no tears in Jannah. Why would you cry in Jannah? It's a place where all your pain and sadness is over. Then he was asked, Musa alayhi salam was asked, why are you crying in Jannah? He said, I'm crying because this, because this young man 
who was sent after me, more people from his ummah will enter Jannah than my ummah. This is the love that a prophet has. It doesn't separate even when he leaves the world. Even when he's in Jannah and all his problems are over, his mind, his heart is still attached to his ummah. So imagine the heart of our Rasul Sallallahu where he is now, worrying about us. And the Prophet Sallallahu and this is not done out of jealousy, but it's because every single Prophet is so attached to his own people who he called, that he can't bear to see people that he invited to the deen go astray. This is the other question I have to ask. When we see the followers of Musa who claim to follow him, do we want them to go to Jannah or do we want bad for them? We should want good for the followers of all the previous prophets, even if they're not following them properly, even if they're doing the wrong things. We should want that they got, are guided to Islam and that their prophet originally will be happy to see at least they came into our ummah. Alhamdulillah. And then, subhanAllah, and then they went up to the seventh sky and the door was opened and lo and behold was Ibrahim alayhi salam, who is obviously the father of all the prophets, the forefather. And this is where he said, say salams to your father, Abraham. And this is showing how the deen of Islam came full circle and reconnected to its Abrahamic roots. That Islam is the true expression of the Abrahamic roots. Uh, what they call the Abrahamic tradition now. Alhamdulillah, it's the Muhammadan tradition, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the Prophet ﷺ went beyond, and he was shown four rivers, as we know. Two rivers that were apparent, and two that were hidden. He saw the Nile and the Euphrates. Even up there in Jannah, he saw the Nile and the Euphrates. But the ulama say, because it, these two rivers are supporting so much life. They are supporting so much life here on earth. And if you look at that, subhanAllah, between those rivers, there is the cradle of Islam. When you look between the, the Euphrates in Iraq and the Nile in Egypt, that the cradle of Islam is inside there. And then he saw also two hidden rivers. He saw Sal Sabil, a river of paradise. And he saw the stream that leads to Kawthar, Al Kawthar. And just, and just remember, we, know, we all know the surah. Inna kal kawthar. Allah says, indeed, we have given you the Kawthar. Do you know why the Kawthar was given to the Prophet ﷺ? Because the Prophet ﷺ, in, his, in the Medinan period, they were persecuted. And subhanAllah, he had one son. And both of his sons actually, they died in their infancy. He lost his son. And when he was being persecuted by the Quraysh, he would walk into the masjid, in the Masjid al-Haram, to pray. And the Quraysh would mock him. And they would say, can you imagine how low they were? when he was going through the loss of his son. They said, this man, don't worry about him. His deen will not survive because he lost his son. So next generation, deen won't survive. He's, and he, they said, he's cut off. He's abtar. They used to call him, you're abtar. You're cut off. You don't have a son. Imagine how hurtful that is. Yes, you're doing your dawah. But now personally, they're attacking you like this. They're personally attacking you. And they would come, one of them would come into the face al asim and Wa'il would come to the face of the Prophet and say, I hate you to his face in a time when he was grieving. And this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, indeed, we have given you Al-Kawthar. Allah gave Kawthar to the Prophet as a consolation for the pain he was going through. And now finally he gets to see Al-Kawthar that Allah promised him. SubhanAllah. And what is the rest of the surah of Kawthar? He says, verily the one who hates you, he will be cut off. And look, Allahu Akbar. That the two sons of that man, because somebody could ask, well, the Prophet didn't have children. I mean, sons living on. And yet that man, al Asim bin Wa'il, his two sons, they lived on. So how can he be abtar? How can he be cut off in his lineage? Because those two sons became Muslim. When those two sons became Muslim, they joined Rasulullah Sallallahu spiritual lineage. So it's like we're all coming from the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu even though he did not have through sons a lineage, because he's like our spiritual father, more than that. And so this was Kawthar that he saw. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there's so many other things, but we will have to choose what we speak about. He then goes to the Bayt al-Ma'mur. Now the way that we have a Kaaba in this world, exactly above our Kaaba in the cosmos, is the Bayt al-Ma'mur. It, it is the celestial house. It's like a mirror Kaaba, a Kaaba in the world and a Kaaba in the sky. And that Kaaba is, subhanAllah, there are so many angels at every time making tawaf 
thousands and tens of thousands of uncountable numbers of angels making tawaf all the time. And it's so big and so crowded that in all of existence of the, of, the, of the universe, from the beginning until Allah destroys it on the Day of Judgment, every angel will only get one chance to go around. SubhanAllah. And so the Prophet Sallallahu sees that and sees Ibrahim Sallam leaning upon it. Leaning upon it. And then he hears, he goes to a place where he hears the screeching of the pens. And he, that sound is what? It's the pens writing down the fate and the destiny in the loha in the kitab, where it's preserved. All of our destinies, he's hearing them being written. And then the Prophet said, which tells us what? That whatever happens to you in life was meant to happen to you. So look forward and ask Allah for the best. And if something bad happened, then you just say, ask Allah for something better, because that destiny was being written long before us. And then the Prophet Sallallahu he, SubhanAllah, this is where he comes to the furthest low tree, Siddat al-Muntaha. The furthest low tree is the extent towards to which the created universe goes. After that point, why do they call it the muntaha? Muntaha is the place of the nihaya. It's the place of the end. Nothing can go beyond that. Nothing goes beyond it. No living creature has ever stepped there. And the ilm of every single created creature stops at that point. And so yet the Prophet ﷺ is called even beyond that. And he describes the, the, the tree, the, the low tree. He says, it was so big, you could walk in its shade for 500 years. They, the leaves are like the, are like the ears of elephants. Of course, these are just approximations. How do you describe something that's even beyond your imagination? So he's just describing it in the way that people would understand. And the Prophet ﷺ, he then, subhanAllah, he goes even beyond that. And then when the Prophet ﷺ goes there, that's when he goes into the divine discourse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What was said between the master and the servant? Nobody knows exactly. Because that person that you love the most, sometimes you have the intimate discourses, discussions. When two people are really close and you see them talking, you, you, you can't know what's going on. Between beloved and the lover, between husband and wife, so many different conversations that take place in the night. Once they're, they're dead and gone, nobody knows what happens. It's a secret that's buried with them. Now, this is a secret that we'll never know. And what we, we also don't know exactly, there was a difference between the Sahaba. Did Rasulullah see Allah on that night or not? Even the Sahaba, there was a difference of opinion. But many of our ulama said, yes, the Prophet did see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when the Prophet then came back, we know he came with 50 prayers. Allah made fard on his ummah 50 prayers. When he met Musa alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam said, listen, I have tried out people before. I have had an ummah before. I have an experience with Bani Israel. They're not going to be able to follow 50 prayers. Go back and ask for something less. So he goes back and Allah reduces it to 40. And then he goes back to Musa alayhi salam in his descent. And Musa alayhi salam said, go back. Your ummah is too weak. They cannot take it. So he goes back and it's reduced to 30. And he goes back again on Musa, Musa Rasam's advice to 20, to 10, finally to 5. And when the Prophet is advised now by Musa salam, that get less, because Musa salam's uh, ummah, they only pray twice a day. He says they couldn't even handle that. So it's an honor that the Prophet said, I'm not going to go below 5 now. And then a voice came out. I have made, I have dis I have made this obligatory on my on this ummah. And that the reward of those five will be the ten of the like, so you get fifty. So next time you're thinking about sleeping into Fajr, just think about where the Prophet had to go to get that command. Every other command came from the skies down to the earth, and this command came from the subhanAllah. The Prophet had to go and get it straight from the heavens. And then the Prophet he came down and said, some of the ulama also say, why did he keep going back and forth to Allah? To get accustomed to being in the presence of Allah. So on the day of judgment, when he makes shafa for us, he will be able to, he'll be intimate, if intimately familiar with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That there won't be that sense of awe. Why? For our sake, when he intercedes for our sins. And then the Prophet ﷺ came down, and as we know, he passed by the caravans of the Quraysh that were in the middle of their journey. And he passed by them and he saw one of them breaking one of their jars of water in the middle of the night. He saw one of them losing a camel. He even went and he took a sip of their water as if time had stopped for him. Time did stop for him. 
And then the Prophet ﷺ went back and it is said that he went back and his bed was just the way he left it. And no one knew that he left. The next morning, the Prophet ﷺ, subhanAllah, he, he awoke and he went outside and he was looking very downcast because he was thinking, how will I tell people what I've just seen? They'll reject it. So Abu Jahl saw the Prophet ﷺ looking downcast and never one to miss an opportunity to put down our Prophet. He came to pretend. You know those people who pretend that they're sympathetic with you? Oh, what happened? What's wrong? The Prophet ﷺ said, I was taken on a journey by night to Masjid Al-Aqsa. Abu Jahl said, overnight? He said, yes. He said, you mean the journey that we take 30 days to go and 30 days to come back you made in a single night? He said, yes. He said, if I bring people here, will you say the same thing? Because he didn't want to go and then maybe he will deny, Maybe the Prophet will deny it. He said, if I bring other people here, will you admit this? He said, yes. So he gathered the people around. And he said, did you go to Jerusalem overnight? And the Prophet said, yes. And they all started to laugh and jeer. And they said, okay, we know you haven't been to Jerusalem. Then describe it for us. And so the Prophet ﷺ began to describe Jerusalem, but he went there during the nighttime. So at some point, he didn't see all the different things. And some of the Quraysh, the elder Quraysh, they had traveled that far because they were traders. And the Prophet ﷺ, it said that the image of the Masjid Al-Aqsa came into the eyes of the Prophet ﷺ as, as though he saw it. And they asked him, how many gates does the Masjid have? And he could count one, two, three. This is how many gates. And he described it. And they said that this, is, this has got to be magic. And then the Prophet ﷺ even told them that your caravans that are coming back, they're at this distance. They'll arrive at this time. And one of them have, has broken one of their jars that they're carrying. One of them lost a camel. And lo and behold, when that time came, and the next day, the caravans in the coming days, they arrived exactly when the Prophet ﷺ said. They came to Abu Bakr anhu. And now what happened was, the, the Muslims who saw this, Many of the Muslims, of course, had complete faith, but many of them, some of the Muslims who had weak Iman because of the persecution, the Quraysh ridiculed the Prophet ﷺ. Look, your Prophet says he went to Aqsa overnight. They didn't even talk about the Bilaj. And some of the Muslims actually lost their faith. So you have to hold on to your faith. And what, who was the one who affirmed it? They went, Abu Bakr, they came to him and said, your Prophet Muhammad وسلم, says that he went there and back overnight. Abu Bakr said, did he really say it? They said, yes. They said, if he said it, then I believe it. If he said it, then I believe it. Because I believe something greater than that. I believe that he gets revelations from the sky down to the earth. And this is why he is called a siddiq the great verifier of the truth. Sometimes you don't have to do anything very much. You don't have to be super Muslim all the time, better than everybody else, but it's something that's inside here. If anything else, have your firm belief in the truth of the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Bakr did not surpass people because of how much he prayed and fasted, as one of the Salaf said, but because of something that was inside his heart. And so, subhanAllah, this is all going to show us that as we, this is the journey, and this is the next day, the Prophet ﷺ gathered all the believers together, and they prayed their first prayer together. Do you guys know which prayer that was? Which prayer was the first prayer they, prayer they all prayed? Sorry, what louder? F Fajr? No, it wasn't Fajr. Fajr? No, it wasn't Fajr. It was. It wasn't Fajr because it was dark at that time, and the Prophet did not tell everybody yet. It was. Next, it was the next one. It was Dhuhr. So Dhuhr prayer was the first prayer that the Muslims prayed together. Jibril himself came to show the Prophet the timings and the method of the prayer, and the believers all followed, and he did this Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, then again Fajr and right back, until it was two days of praying. And this is how the Ummah started their prayers and has been going on and on and on until our prayer just today, alhamdulillah. Unbroken chain of prayers now spread all over the world. And they say that the reason why Dhuhr prayer was the first prayer was because it was time to show in the, in the daytime, in the sun, they're not hiding anymore. That Islam is now here to eclipse all the other ways and philosophies. It's come to bring that good news. And so subhanAllah, what do we understand from all this? There's so many lessons from the Isra and the Mi'raj. But the one thing that we know from the beginning is that this shows the status of our beloved Rasul Wasallam. Don't let anyone put any idea or doubt inside your heart about the Rasul Wasallam. He suffered for our sake. He went through all of this torture for our sake. And what it tells you 
is that in your life, you may go through many, many hardships. But when you go through difficulties on earth for the sake of Allah and you're honest to Allah, and Allah sees what you're going through, even the heavens will get involved to bring you your justice, to bring you your relief. That when you have expended all your energy for the sake of Allah, this is why we started with the dua of the Prophet ﷺ, after he had tried everything, then it comes. Sometimes the relief does not come until you've tried everything that you have. Give it your everything, whether it's in any aspect of your life, in your marriage, in your job, in raising your children, in holding on to your faith. And also the subhanAllah, that when these things, when sometimes, you know, the fact that the Prophet ﷺ came back, as we know, the great poet, uh, Allama Iqbal, alayhi, he said, this is the, pro the difference between a prophet and a saint. If a saint goes up to heaven and sees the beauty of Jannah and leaves behind the world, he's happy, he doesn't want to come back. A prophet returns. Our Prophet ﷺ was the one who returned. He could have stayed there and saw and everything could have been better for him. But he chose to come back. Why? For our sake. And don't think it got easier for him. When he went back, he came back to Badr. He came back to the Hijra, leaving his homeland. He came back to Badr, to Uhud, to burying three of his daughters and one son, losing his companions. He came back to struggle more, but he had the believers and prayers with him. When we have salah in our lives, this is when Islam began to expand. Hijra happened very shortly after. The, the relief came to the Muslims, but new tests will come. But you know what? You'll be strong enough to handle them because you're holding on to your prayers. You're holding on to the love of Allah and Rasul Sallallahu You'll become strong enough to handle anything that Allah puts in your way through your faith with Allah. And just remember as well that the victory did come. The physical victory of coming back to Mecca. The moral victory of forgiving his enemies at the end of his life. But the spiritual victory has to come in your life first. Don't think that you're going to be successful first in the world and then later on will become religious. No. Commit yourself to Allah and following the Prophet ﷺ right now and then the victory will come. Don't try to chase after the dunyawi victory before the spiritual victory. Strive for Allah's sake. And just remember, subhanAllah, that no matter how much we go through, no matter how much we go through, that this is the sunnah of Allah on earth. That those who love Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu will go through tests. And it does not mean that Allah has forsaken you. Rather, it's the opposite. It means that you are beloved to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. It means that you are close to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and that Allah wants the best for you. But it takes Iman to understand that. Don't expect the rest of the world to understand why do you people go through earthquakes? Why do you people go through oppression? Because we know that there is something waiting for us from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. قول قولي هذا استغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين استغفروا إنه غفور رحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم may Allah accept this inshallah may Allah guide those who are seeking guidance and may Allah Taala make us of those who act upon the advices of the Israel and Biraj and stand on our prayers جزاكم خيرا and I apologize for that inshallah بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه أجمعين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكوننا من الخاسرين ربنا لا تزيق قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك تلوحاب ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما يا الله يا رحمن يا رحمن يا رحمن يا رحيم يا الله thank you so much for every single blessing that you've given us يا الله Thank you for creating us. Thank you for giving us faith. Thank you for giving us health and our families. Thank you for letting us say La ilaha illallah. Thank you for your Quran. Thank you for sending us your beloved Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Thank you for making us part of his ummah. Thank you for letting us gather together to hear about one chapter of his life. Thank you for, thank you for sending him and all of his sacrifices, O oh Allah. Increase the rank and the reward and the salats and the salams on our beloved Rasul Sallallahu for everything that he had to go through to get this to us. Oh Allah, make us of those who carry the banner of deen in our own hearts, in the hearts of our families, our communities, and the entire world. Ya Allah, do not let us stop spreading this message of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until we go back to meet him in al firdaus Ya Allah. Make it easy for us, guide our families, keep our youth, Ya Allah, within the fold of the deen.
Ya Allah, everyone who is going through oppression, anxiety, depression, Ya Allah, any type of trauma or abuse, Ya Allah, relieve them all from their suffering. All of those in this land and in the Muslim world. Ya Allah, all those victims of the earthquake and any other disasters, Ya Allah, make it easy for them. Ya Allah, all those people who have passed away in your path, Ya Allah, with la ilaha illallah in their hearts, give them Jannatul Firdaus. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, guide our youth. Make our children on the right path. Do not let them go astray. Ya Allah, in this land, Ya Allah, let us be good examples to people. Ya Allah, let us be those people who when other people look, they say, what a beautiful thing a Muslim is. What a beautiful example they have. And what a beautiful prophet they must have had, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Allah, make us of those who people get to know about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through our behavior and through our love. Ya Allah, make us of those, Ya Allah, not of those who people look at and they turn away from Islam, Ya Allah, but people who they look at and are guided to the light, Ya Allah. Make us the solution every in our societies, Ya Allah. Make us a part of the solution wherever we go. Give us success in every single way for our sake and for our benefit in the benefit of the entire Ummah. Ya Allah, a Surah al -Fatiha. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I apologize for going on a little bit longer. Assalamu alaikum.